let, let me ask you something or maybe answer something. Mm-hmm. You, you raised uh, the idea of my book, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, Stigma. And I wanted to run something past you because I think it's connected with your outsider thing. Mm. So in the book, people can buy at Harvard University Press. It's been put out in a second edition, 2021, uh, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality. Um, I try to... De- I read it. <laughs> I try to develop <laughs> an idea, an idea about a certain kind mm-hmm. of what I call biased social cognition, a certain kind of anti-Black effect that's not discrimination and that's not stereotyping and it's 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 different and i i want to see what you think about since you're using this phrase I, and whether it comports with the way in which you are which you're using it i got it from your book actually that idea I got from your book that book that idea was embedded in my book so i i say yes. that people have models of the world in their head that they use to interpret their data they they, they have crude explanatory matrices. They have a framework. And that the way that they arrive at the framework is not entirely rational. It's not strictly deductive. It's not only driven by evidence. It's driven by meanings. Put that word in quote. Meanings as distinct from from logic. The meaning is a kind of pattern recognition conformity thing. It feels right. It's intuitively plausible. Not not that I have done an estimate and my estimate is 6.5 on this parameter, but rather that the framework that I'm using through which I will see the world and interpret evidence feels right to me. Can I ask a question? Can I interject and ask a question very quickly? Does that also include comfort? Well, yes, it could. I mean, in, in the cognitive dissonance of discomfort that might come if a certain narrative is inconsistent with what I presuppose to be a, a good fit. I'm made uncomfortable by the fact it doesn't quite fit. Um, and I'm, I, I, I have an example. And the, the example is uh, men and women, blacks and whites, and disparity. So I see a disparity, men and women, and it makes me uncomfortable. I see a disparity black and white, and it doesn't make me so uncomfortable. In the uh, uh, academic discipline, it might be that gender disparities are much harder to give an account for, but people may be more able to assimilate ethnic racial disparities into their framework without it triggering a sense of, of disquiet. Or another example I give is incarceration, where men are vastly outnumbered amongst the people who are put in jail relative to women. Blacks are also vastly outnumbered relative to their number in the population compared to whites. But whereas we might think mass incarceration by race is a problem, we don't think mass incarceration by male-female is a problem at all. We, we accept the huge racial uh, male-female disparity in punishment because we really, deep down, our social meanings associate violence and law-breaking and uncivil behavior with male more so than female, that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about Mm -hmm. racial stigma, I'm saying the the tendency to embrace an essentialist explanation. So we're confronted with the fact relatively few theoretical physicists who are Black amongst all theoretical physicists Mm -hmm. What is the account that we're prepared in the back of our minds to entertain for that, for that fact? Well, blacks just aren't up to it. They don't do that good at mathematical subjects or the, whatever would be one kind of account. The account that you gave was very different. You said, no, you don't believe and have never believed in your experience contradicts the fact that there's not just as many p- black people who are brilliant at this, that or the other. But you said, then you had your accounts that you gave, which is a non-essentialist. It's not intrinsic to the people themselves, this kind of thing. Yeah. So stigma is the inclination or orientation to settle for quasi-essentialist accounts of racial disparity uh, rather than interrogate your model. I mean, because it creates a problem, right? A a problematic, a a whole range Mm -hmm. of problems. I've got these disparities. I am committed to an uh, anti-essentialist axiom, my axiom of anti-essentialism. How do I account for these disparities without repairing to essentialist account. 
that throws up a whole set of problems to be investigated, which problems will never be investigated by the stigmatizing observer who thinks, well, that's just the way they are. What's the point in us worrying about? Yes. Um, so the, it's interesting because one of the sort of stigma part is, is interesting because why is it that, you know, stigma is sort of like, I got to keep this, this, you know, somehow this will muddy up or what uh, is the word for this? You, you know, for, when I think stigma, I want to keep Pollution. away, you know, this, this, this is, this is uncomfortable. This is, this gets in the way of what I'm trying to, what, you know, what this, you know, what, what I'm trying to do here. Um, and I walk in a room and I am, you know, a six foot five towering black man with a baseball hat on. And, you know, I got a bunch of quantum gravity stuff going on in my head, but I walk in that room and, you know, just a bunch of characters from the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can run that experiment and have some hidden cameras yeah, and yeah. see how that we, they deal with that stigma, how both sides deal with the stigma, as you call You know, that, that thing is running in the back of your, or maybe the prefrontal context, or maybe the medulla, wherever it's running. But I can tell you that um, those types of physical threats, so to speak, you know, I've definitely... Um, experience that. I've definitely tried to figure out ways to mitigate that. I got to tell um, you a story. And um, Well, yeah. it's kind of mm -hmm. like you would be telling this story, except I'm the one telling it this time. So I'm a professor at Boston University. It's in the 1990s. And I'm, I'm pretty, uh, you know, I'm a university professor, okay? I'm in my 40s. I mean, I'm, you know, and uh, late 40s. And I'm at the Japanese restaurant having a solo lunch. And these guys from uh, the uh, operations research department in the business school walk in and sit down at the table next to me. And they start talking about queuing theory. So queuing theory is about queues. It's about lines and random arrival and random service and the probability distribution of how many people are in line after a certain length of time based upon the stochastic arrival and the stochastic service. Except their problem was different. Their problem was a stoplight in an intersection. And how long would the length of cars be waiting at the intersection at a red light based on different <laughs> stochastic flows of cars on, on the two different roads that were intersecting each other? So they, they're just talking, they're just talking queuing theory. So I'm listening and eating my lunch. And uh, at the end of the, uh, of the lunch, as I'm walking by their table, I lean over and I say, have you seen the paper by Schmidt uh, on this, uh, this aspect of queuing theory? It was just a guy, this paper that I read 10 years before when I was, uh, you know, doing a little bit of research on queuing theory. And do you know what this guy, this white guy uh, said to me? He looked up to me and he said, what? who are you? He, he didn't say yes or no, I have seen the paper. He didn't say the paper is relevant to the mm -hmm. problem that we were discussing. He said, who are you? To have to have an what? idea. He didn't vet my idea. He didn't, he, he was made uncomfortable by the fact that the idea was coming from me. So I pulled out my card. I said, I'm university professor of economics and fellow of the econometric society, Glenn Lowry. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he was flabbergasted. He said, I'm sorry. <laughs> well. I got another interesting story. This is when I was a postdoc. Um, I was at a conference in Germany. Um, and I, you know, you know, there's a usual thing. People around, huddle around the corner. And I no noticed that there was an interesting conversation going on there. So I kind of hover over, kind of like, you know, listening and leaning in. And they were talking about some Alexander, this Alexander thing, <laughs> right? So Alexander's uh, mechanism or what have you. And... <laughs> It turned out that it's actually, it was a paper that recently written and people were talking about it because it started a little thing in the field, okay? So I'm like <laughs> listening in. And oh, by the way, I had 15 years worth of dreadlocks oh, your, at the your time. Story so is like, better I used to wear mine. suits, but I had to, <laughs> I, okay. So then 
So then at some point I jump in because I feel, you know, normally I don't, but I, I felt empowered because they're talking about my stuff. So so I, I, I forgot what I said exactly. I said something about, I kind of injected an idea. And so some of them looked, looked and they continued talking over me, right? As if like you have, you don't exist. So now I, I got a little bit, you know, a, a little bit agitated. And I was like, actually, no, you know, I think that this is, I kind of pushed back. And then they were like, it was a kind of similar, like, who are you kind of thing, question. Um, or what are you doing here? You know, well, you don't know what you're talking about. And I said, actually, I am, Ale I am that <laughs> Alexander you're talking about, who's work, right? And you should have seen the look in some of their faces. Answer, yeah. Right. Right. And no, I, it was a very enjoyable one of those moments in my career where I was like, it really happens. But when I was like, wow, that's, um, this is like from, from out of a movie or something. Um, yeah, but I, uh, Glenn, I, um, I think that we, it's funny, we talk about all these other, you know, the other isms and the, the reasons why we, why there's a problem, why, you know, you know, say blacks don't succeed or maybe we shouldn't be doing science. Maybe we're not, it's not, you know, it's, it's a white man's language. We've often hear that. Um, and, um, There is something going on, but it's none of those things. I, I think it's closer, to, like, you know, when you are uncomfortable, when there's stigma and, and you can't speak of it because it's stigma by definition, then, and that, that, that's right. So for me, one becomes, through stigma, you can become an outsider um, and that not because you are actively deviating or actively doing anything wrong, just by default of the stigma that comes with, you know, with the phenotypical, what have you, pro projections and, um, as you say, this, this um, I, you said it better than me, so I'm not going to attempt to say it again. Um, but I, that, I, 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 I resonate with that, with that concept. And therefore, I think being able to, to um, how do you work with that? And I think like the outsider thing in my book, which is to say, okay, I can now see clearly that I, you know, that, People on they feel they feel uncomfortable with, with just with me being in the room, so to speak, for these other reasons um, that is unspeakable. Um, but the flip side of that is, well, I don't have to worry too much about being kicked out of the club. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can think these thoughts, and sometimes I might hit a jackpot because maybe one of those thoughts that everybody else is afraid of having might be a pathway um, to the solution of the problem, right? So learning how to, how to um, see also the advantages to the stigma um, and, and also realizing that if it is stigma, then guess what? You're acting more of a low life than I am, actually, and pretending to be, you know, um, you know um, uh, whatever, a, a more evolved human being. I mean, the fact that if you're exercising stigma without yourself, what was the word? Using any kind of self-referential, um, you know. Um, I get it. 